Hey, it's Mike here, and today we're gonna have a little battle of the mics because I'm gonna respond to Dr. Mike's video, What's the Deal with Red Meat? Dr. Mike has a YouTube channel, and he describes himself as number one health slash medical influencer with five million plus followers. He has two million subscribers on YouTube, and so I guess he just added up all the followers across all the platforms. That's not really how it works, but that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to see if his conclusions and recommendations about red meat are responsible medical advice for his millions of followers. All right, let's just go right into the video. It's 2018, and the field of nutritional research is an absolute mess. Tell me about it. I mean, we have people saying it's like okay to eat processed meat and stuff, and what? This video is what? Thanks to the National Pork Board for sponsoring this video. Hashtag spots. I actually thought that he was joking when he said that the first time. He is not joking, but he assures you he's gonna, he's gonna make a really unbiased video about pork while taking money from the pork industry. I, on the other hand, am sponsored by my conscience. Hashtag spots by your cons. Conch. Hashtag condescending. But moving forward, he actually spends the middle chunk of this video touring his friend's meat packing plant. Conflict of interest number two. That one of my closest friends owns a meat facility. So I ventured out to Lenny's facility to see what happens to that meat. Dr. Sausage reporting for duty. Oh man, I need to decide how much I'm gonna hold back on this video. It's gonna be hard. Let's go to the smokehouse. Right, but actually the temperature inside here is over a hundred degrees. So if you're working here, you're sweating. These working conditions are horrible. So what happens in the smokehouse? Basically here we cook our products, whether we dry cook, we smoke or we steam, we meet lethality. Lethality, I know they're talking about microbes, but is it any coincidence that they're bringing it from a class 2A to a class 1A carcinogen by smoking them? It becomes a processed meat. And I was actually really surprised to see that he admitted this right away. If a product is smoked, that makes it a processed meat at that time, right? That's correct. Once we introduce salt or cooking, it becomes a processed meat. But then you realize that it's like the whole point of the video is to convince you that it's just A-OK -okay to be eating these carcinogens. Just wait. Uh, the World Health Organization labeled red meats as a group 2A carcinogen, meaning that they're a probable carcinogen. There's a lot of correlation data, not causation data, so they can't call it definite. And I would say the cancer connection here is a little bit more than just an association. You don't just throw something into the class 2A carcinogen category because of some light correlation. Red meat has heme iron and the oxidative stress cancer pathway has been well established. If Dr. Mike were to respond to this, he might say, yeah, well, it's actually just heme iron interacting with nitrates, that is it. Well, actually from this study, it's a double whammy. You have the nitroso compound connection and then you have the formation of cytotoxic and genotoxic aldehydes by lipoperoxidation. That's the oxidation of fat, which is present in red meat. And sadly, they have demonstrated this by inducing cancer in mice. Sadly, and unnecessary, but worth noting. But to sum it up, this is not just some harmless correlation like people who wear sandals tend to go to beaches more. No, this is cancer. This video is sponsored by the National Sandal Board of America. They should really limit their processed meats in their diet. If they can avoid them, great. But if they have an occasional hot dog to celebrate a baseball game or Memorial Day weekend, it's not the end of the world. Have you met the average American? The occasional hot dog and the occasional slices of bacon and the occasional lunch meat, well, that all comes together and adds up to every day, basically all the time. And what he's really functionally saying is, Looks like meat's back on the menu, boys. There's so many risks we face every single day over the course of a lifespan that talking about one hot dog isn't worth the time. This guy is the master of the appeal to futility. Just, just give up. Just drink a little bit of Drano. Because there are a lot of dangerous things out there, you should constantly choose to engage in dangerous activities and consume dangerous substances. But seriously, talking specifically in terms of the logic here, there is probably an amount of cigarettes that statistically won't increase your risk of lung cancer. But it's a horrible idea to ascribe that strategy. From this study, 44% of smokers questioned belong to the group who perceive themselves as smoking too few cigarettes to be at risk. They're definitely wrong. I would venture to say that there is a similar psychological phenomenon occurring with the moderate consumption of carcinogenic meats. And I will add that it's not just the cancer risk here from red meat. Meat. There are other risks, which we will get into in a bit, but first let's move on and continue this tour. This is shooting a sanitizer so that when you walk through each area, you don't cross contaminate. It's actually a really smart way to prevent infections. So just packaging this food is so dangerous that every time you walk from room to room, you have to get sprayed in a torrent of disinfecting foam. Why? Well, first of all, virtually all of our infectious diseases come from animals at first. The flu we originally got from ducks, 
Smallpox were originally camelpox, and of course we have the swine flu. We also give 80% of our antibiotics to livestock, and from the review on antimicrobial resistance, they are projecting that by the year 2050, these antimicrobial resistant, antibiotic resistant infections will kill more people than cancer. Mostly because we wanted to eat animals, a lot of them. Something to think about. You can't talk about meats without discussing factory raised pork versus pasture raised pork. And I'm a firm proponent of eating meats that are pasture raised. Why? It's better for the animal, it's more ethical. They're living uh, a species specific lifestyle. They're roaming how they want. They're eating the correct diet that they should. Okay, so Dr. Mike, you never ever ever eat any meat unless you absolutely for sure know that it wasn't factory farmed. Really, every single restaurant you go to, you're completely sure, you just don't eat at restaurants basically. And on top of that, you're getting a healthier meat, more vitamin content, better fatty acid uh, profiles. So nutritious, it's the healthier carcinogen. And as one commenter put it, quote, eating red meat for nutrients is like drinking Coke for potassium. Now, why does this whole don't eat factory farm point sort of not sit well and feel empty to me? Well, firstly, if you look at Alex's meat on the package, there is nothing about how it's pasture raised or anything of that sort on the front. No, this package is selling culture. It's not selling welfare. So I could say with a very high level of certainty that this is factory farm meat that he's holding in his hand and promoting. And that's because in a capitalist world, if you're a company and you put a ton of extra effort into the way that you make your product, you're gonna plaster it on the front and make it super obvious and not hide it. And there are several reasons why it sort of doesn't matter anyway. And the first is maybe you're in the grocery store looking for some pasture raised or free range pig meat. To help you out, let me just get the definition of pasture raised pigs and oh wait, there is no definition in the US legally for pasture raised or free range pigs. Warning about some non-graphic but sensitive imagery. Free range can look like this. Free range pigs just not in cages can never see the sun in their basically entire lives until they're killed. So what you're getting is a humane washed chunk of suffering and even the very, very rare farms that go and do silva pasture and let the pigs go around in the forest, a lot of times they'll put hooks on their noses so that they can't actually root without hurting themselves. And then finally, doesn't matter how they're raised because they're killed against their will at the human equivalent age of like 10. But the topic of him being against factory farming brings me directly to the pork board itself. The pork board, like other checkoffs, is a government organization whose sole purpose is to sell you as much of their product, in this case, pigs, as they can. The pork board makes virtually all of its money from factory farmed pigs, from confined pigs and has been caught illegally sending money to lobbying organizations, which lobby against the welfare of pigs to be more efficient and make more money. So how much money did you take from these people, Dr. Mike? Maybe, maybe $10,000, $30,000. Anyway, back to the sausage. This and is the chilling room? Where's the, the couch? Room. Where's the Xbox? How can we chill in here with no That's Xbox? It's so fun touring this house of horrors. If I'm happy enough about it, maybe you'll forget that I'm walking by literal corpses. You've seen the process from the start. We cut the pork, we package the pork. Uh, actually it starts with the forcible impregnation of sows and fair and crates and then continues with the torture and insanity of a highly intelligent creature that can recognize themselves in the mirror. And I'm pretty sure the meat packing process starts with a little something called slaughter. No, M M Mike, we don't go behind that door. We don't. Flame touching the meat, that can create a compound known as HAA. It stands for heterocyclic aromatic amines. And I know that's a mouthful, but basically those are carcinogens. Now there are some really simple steps you can take to reduce the amount of these forming. How to reduce carcinogens while cooking your meat? What is it? Is it okay to eat carcinogens? It's not, you care about eating carcinogens now? What? I'm just trying to have a hot dog at the ball game here. Why are you trying to confuse me? All right, well, how to actually reduce carcinogens. Step one, don't eat them. People I know prefer chicken to pork under the assumption that they think pork has more fat. But when you compare uh, a tenderloin cut, like what we're eating, compared to chicken breast, it actually has the same amount of fat. Finally, a point we actually agree on, and I just did a video recently on this, and I will tie it into a point coming right up. But now we gotta grill it. What better place to do it than right on top of New York City? Clearly, business is good for the Sausage King. It's like this is an actual commercial for carnism. I love my dog and I eat my pigs and I love my dog and I kill pigs which are more intelligent than dogs. Risks that pop up into the conversation are colorectal cancer and heart disease. 
Let's take colorectal cancer first. I agree with the World Cancer Research Fund on this, who recommends eating less than 500 grams of red meat per week, uh, which is approximately 17 and a half ounces. Because when you're eating below the 500 gram mark, uh, the increases in colorectal cancer risk are statistically not significant. Tell me who in the US actually divvies up and, and measures their meat consumption. Okay, maybe you eat meat. How many grams of red meat did you eat yesterday? How about the date? Like, what is this? Again, that's not how human behavior works. And a doctor like Dr. Mike should know that high fat, high salt foods are addictive. And in this conversation, we're talking about foods like bacon. And so it's a very irresponsible recommendation to tell somebody to limit a highly addictive food, but keep eating it. Just keep eating it, it's fine. I'm the cool doctor. You might not live as long with me, and that's why I get all the followers, but you know, I'm the cool doctor. Moving on to cardiovascular disease, these studies have been all over the place. There's been positive correlations, negative correlations. Suffice to say that it's not conclusive. Firstly, it's frustrating that once again, there are no studies in the description of his videos. It's just, I'm a doctor and listen to me. Every video I do, all of the studies are linked in the description. Basic. Well, he can't deny the processed meat heart disease connection. He's probably looking to studies like this one by Mozafarian, talking about how there's, you know, no risk or maybe a small risk associated. But there are a few problems with this. First of all, Mozafarian in the past has taken money directly from pharmaceutical companies that make statins, which are cholesterol lowering drugs. And the other problem here, which speaks to his chicken comment earlier, is that in the standard American diet, we have so many sources of atherogenic animal foods that you might lower the consumption of one and then increase the consumption of the other that usually happens with the red meat being replaced by chicken. For measuring the atherogenic potential on saturated fat alone, we can look to this Harvard chart, which shows that removing any one sort of group of animal products might give you a five to 15% lowering of saturated fat. So you probably won't get a dramatic result by say removing red meats, but you'll still probably die of heart disease way younger than you would like. It's when you take all of the animal products out that you start seeing super dramatic results. For example, we have Dr. Esselstyn's clinical trial. He put 200 people with advanced cardiovascular disease on a whole food vegan diet and stopped heart attacks and strokes in their tracks and showed a measurable unclogging of arteries. And people who went off the diet had 100 times more heart attack and stroke than those who stuck with it, which is ridiculous. And that's not just correlation, that's a clinical trial. And in terms of meat consumption, it's about more than just two diseases, cancer and heart disease. It's also about obesity, for example. And from the epidemiology, we can see that people who have lower meat consumption, the semi-veg group tends to still be on average overweight. Well, vegans are on average in the normal BMI. And there are other studies that also show a correlation between meat consumption and obesity. And back to this Mozafarian study, he even admits that there is a connection between not just processed, but unprocessed red meat and diabetes. My piece of dietary advice, which I follow and recommend to my patients, is that we really should be following a plant-based diet. Oh, a plant-based diet? That's rich in fruits and vegetables, has whole grains, and lean sources of protein with red meats in moderation. And that's why I say I'm vegan instead of plant-based because to a lot of people, plants are just the basis and then they throw all the meat on it. My final point here is that over and over again, he is saying something and then doing something else. For example, he says, don't eat factory farm meat and then he goes to a meat packing plant that I can say with very high certainty, maybe I'm wrong about this, is processing factory farmed meat. Then he says, you know, eat a smaller amount of red and processed meat and then goes and shows an absurdly large amount of meat that he cooks at the end. It's like he's only paying lip service to make you feel better about eating a carcinogenic, atherogenic, obesogenic, diabetogenic hunk of meat from an animal that no matter which way you spin it, didn't wanna die. Sorry to break it to you. Bottom line, no doctor should be taking money from a carcinogenic food producer when their goal as a health professional should be to improve the health of their constituents. Once again, I wanna give a huge thank you to the National Pork Board for partnering with me on this video and allowing me to have an unfiltered, honest, evidence-based conversation. And don't be fooled, the pork board paid him to make this video. They funded this video to promote the consumption of pork. So nobody's gonna leave this video and live a healthier life. They're gonna leave this video and say, oh, the doctor said it was A-OK -okay to keep processed meat in my diet.
All right, that's it for today. Yeah, maybe I got a little ranty in this one. Maybe I got a little bitter and sarcastic, but hey, it's how I felt about it truly deep inside. Hashtag sponsor my cons. And so I would just finally like to thank my Patreons for supporting me so I can continue making videos like this. And also I realize a lot of people still don't know about my e-cookbook with a bunch of whole food vegan recipes because I don't actually mention it that much. I try not to mention it too much, but feel free to check it out. Link in the description. All right, thanks for watching. Feel free to let me know down below what you think about all this and I'll see you in the next video.